Welcome to New Europe Studios. With us today is Mrs. Luca Cazzelli. She is a professor of economics at the University of Athens, and she is also the former minister, a former minister of economics and development uh, in Greece. In Greece, is actually her name is very famous because it's uh, related to a law that she had the she passed, uh, which saved many many Greek families. Uh, Mrs. Cazzelli, welcome to New Europe Studios. Thank you very much. It's I want to, to start here. with uh, the Cacelli law, as we call it. Uh, can you speak a little bit about this? Sure. This was um, this law 3868, it's uh, 69 as it is known in Greece. It's a law which actually protects uh, the uh, debtor against uh, loans uh, that he or she cannot repay back to the bank. And it's a progressive law that actually exists in many European countries. We were not the first to implement it. Uh, but it has a twist, which is an interesting, that maybe we are one of the few countries where the uh, debtor can go to the courts, present all the data on income and wealth, and the court can issue a, a decree or an, a decision that the debtor who is unable to repay debts can save the first house that mm -hmm. he or she or the family lives in. And uh, in the midst, this was passed in 2010, just as we started with the crisis in Greece and the first standby agreement. And now we have about 150,000 families uh, who had had recourse to the law and are able, in the midst of this crisis that we have, to save their homes and be able to restructure their loans. Actually, this is related and this is very important because Greece, as we all know, uh, went into this austerity, this harsh austerity program, which produced a lot of social problems. Uh, you are also known for having disagreed with a lot of aspects of this austerity programs in Greece. Uh, this, actually, you disagreed twice and you refused to, as a, as a member of the parliament, to vote for them, which brought, brought some problems between you and your party. Isn't that right? That's absolutely right. Uh, actually, since the beginning, while I was a minister, uh, while I was negotiating with the Troika, whom I had uh, on a daily basis, both in the Ministry of Economy and then in the Ministry of Labour, uh, I was arguing that a harsh austerity program uh, as, like the one that we had in Greece would produce exactly the opposite results. That the recession would be extremely deep, that unemployment would rise, and that people would be unable to repay loans mm -hmm. and to repay debts. And that we had an external debt problem, which was a problem of Greece, uh, but we managed to convert it through the harsh austerity program into an internal debt pro problem. And so now we have a double problem. We have an external debt problem and an internal debt problem as people and families are unable to pay taxes, are unable to pay uh, loans, are unable to pay social security contributions. So this harsh austerity program does not help. Taxes are extremely high and the middle class is being uh, uh, actually driven to, to mm -hmm. poverty uh, to the extent that the uh, society is being polarized and phenomena like the Golden Dawn are actually the results of a, a policy which is uh, ill-conceived. Uh, a while ago, before the European elections, both here in Brussels and in Athens, the Greek government, tried to present the Greek austerity program, the Troika program, program as a big success. So, obviously, you don't agree with this. Well, uh, I would like to hear the criteria against which we judge a program. Uh, if the criteria is uh, uh, kind of managing uh, competitiveness, the program has failed. Competitiveness has not increased, despite uh, reductions in wages of about 30 and 40 percent. If you look at price competitiveness in terms of final prices, it has deteriorated. Uh, if you judge a program in terms of debt to GDP ratios, the debt to GDP ratio was 120 percent, it's now over 170 percent and it's supposed to, uh, to increase even further. If you judge it in terms of unemployment, the unemployment rate has risen to 30 percent and we have an unemployment rate of over 50 percent for the young people. So it's a program 
uh, in terms of growth, we are now the seventh consecutive uh, year of mm -hmm. deep recession. And uh, uh, despite uh, kind of a, the, the economic activity slowly, slowly starting picking up, still the, the recession is still going on and industrial production is falling and exports are falling. So what is the sole criterion that we can, uh, that the government and the Troika is actually uh, talking about in terms of success? It's the fiscal deficit and the uh, achievement of a primary surplus. Now, even if we accept the fact that there might be a primary surplus, uh, there are still doubts because the government how, is... How it's produced, Well, yes. how exactly it's measured and uh, the, the fact that the government is owing to the private sector a lot. But even if we accept that there is a primary surplus, a primary surplus, first of all, would not be sustainable unless you have, unless you have a resumption of growth. And secondly, the primary surplus itself is, a, is an endogenous variable, as we would say mm -hmm. in economics. Um, fiscal austerity uh, per se is something necessary, but it's not a sufficient condition mm -hmm. for either a sustainable growth or for economic prosperity. So it, it is important that the Greek government uh, uh, is, uh, has a fiscal consolidation program. I will be one of the first to support a program of uh, fiscal mm -hmm. consolidation, but this has to be embedded in a strategy which is viable, which is long term, and which produces results uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the well being of the people. And what would you recommend? Say, uh, recommend <laughs> as uh, such a strategy? Well, I think at this point uh, there are three things that need to be done. The first one is that you need to address, and we need to address collectively as Europeans, the debt issue. This is a systemic problem in Europe. Uh, the present Greek debt is unsustainable and we need to all collectively address it whether we like it or not S through, through a proper restructuring like we did with the uh, law, the Catelli law internally. The second one is that Greece needs reforms but these the reforms that are being uh, right now implemented are not actually development reforms, are fiscal uh, measures in disguise. Uh, we need an administrative reform, we need a tax reform where you expand the tax base. Mm -hmm. We need a regulatory reform so that an investor can invest uh, with no major bottlenecks, uh, start a business, uh, license a business, close a business. Uh, we need a judicial reform. Uh, you have decisions in courts which, which might last three and four and five years. So if we want to promote investment in Greece, we need kind of well-designed uh, reforms that can be implemented. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, not, not much attention has been paid to this, by either by the IMF or by the Troika. And the third thing you need, as I said, a different policy mix. You need to lower taxes. Right now, the tax burden, especially for the middle class, is enormous. Uh, you, you will not be able, for the time being, to raise wages uh, or pensions, which you should in the medium term. But certainly, you can go on to bring liquidity to the market. Uh, right now there is no liquidity and even viable firms do not have uh, liquidity. Uh, you need to, do, to expand the law in terms of the restructuring of loans and to provide the space so that viable firms can start producing again and invest. Uh, all this, of course, is not <coughs> only particular to Greece. There are other countries in the European Union, especially in the South, which face not exactly the same perhaps, but Equal, in, equally important problems. Uh, I know that you have been a member of the Committee for the Progressive Economy Initiative. That's right. That was set up by the Mr. Uh, Hannes Svoboda. Svoboda, exactly. That's right. uh, so some, some of these elements that you just mentioned, are they part of the recommendations of this committee? Absolutely. Just before the Euro elections, the Scientific Committee of the Progressive Economy Initiative issued a call for change. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, arguing against the present austerity program that is being followed uh, across Europe, uh, saying that Europe is not going to meet the challenges of this uh, very competitive uh, global uh, economy unless it changes its policy, and uh, uh, bringing forth specific uh, recommendations for investment promotion, for redistribution, 
and especially for tackling the inequality problem, which is getting uh, very important and uh, very grave in Europe. And Mr. Tsapogas, I'm really worried as a European, and I'm a very much of a pro-European, that unless we tackle through uh, forward-looking policies these issues, these social issues, that uh, there will not be Europe anymore that Europe is going to be undermined uh, uh, and the, when there is a vacuum, the vacuum is being uh, filled. And when you see the rise of right-wing parties, of very nationalistic parties, very racist parties and so on throughout Europe, this means that politics as we know it have failed. And the reason that politics have failed is that uh, politicians uh, have failed to put, uh, to address uh, kind of current economic issues with a uh, developmental and a social uh, perspective. And austerity per se is not the solution. Uh, austerity uh, produces uh, marginalization, poverty, and, uh, and inequality. And uh, we, should be, we should be willing as politicians and as policy makers to address these challenges and to understand and to say that uh, we have to put a stop to these uh, austerity programs and we need to do it collectively. We need to regulate the banking sector. The financial sector has become way too important. Uh, it actually plays a catalytic role uh, across the globe. Uh, it uh, influences a lot politics uh, and to the detriment of uh, politics and after the financial crisis we all thought that uh, this is the time that the political system will be able we'll to regulate, will step regulate. in and regulate. Yes. Instead, we've seen exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. The financial system has taken the upper hand and it dictates the terms of the settlement. Uh, we all know that such recommendations as the ones we are voicing now fell on deaf ears a while ago, w both within the European institutions as well as at some, some of the European capitals. Mm -hmm. uh, after the elections and after the, the European elections and after the shock that followed, uh, do you believe that now the, they are more amenable, let's say, to listen to this kind of recommendations? Is that a change of uh, well, approach? Uh, I'm afraid that it's not the political um, results of the elections that uh, make politicians open their ears, but it's uh, also the crisis that uh, continues. Mm -hmm. And I think people realize that unless there is, there has to be a reversal. The thing is, uh, Germany especially, uh, which is playing a leading role, needs to, to see this challenge. It's really kind of ironic in a way when uh, uh, they, this past week they instituted a minimum wage in Germany and uh, yes. for the first Eight time. Point, uh, At the same time, uh, in countries like Greece, they kind of uh, pushed and they succeeded to dismantle all collective agreements mm -hmm. that we had. And when I was minister, one of my actual experiences was that uh, in my negotiations with the Troika, is that all social partners were backing me and uh, uh, both industrialists and uh, workers and so on. And uh, unfortunately, I. Uh, well, I renegotiated it, but there was tremendous pressure to actually dismantle all of the social dialogue. So, um, Germany has a very important role to play. It needs to address uh, the challenges both of the German economy, but also Germany as a major power in Europe. And there has to be collective pressure from all countries that if we're going to be as a united Europe, especially in the Eurozone, mm -hmm. we need to have a sim not asymmetric but symmetric approaches to adjustment and growth. Uh, of course all this is very important for the European Union, especially since it faces uh, this gap between North and South. Uh, there's a, there are other important issues of course for the European Union and these are to the East. Absolutely. Like we have at this moment the Ukraine problem. Absolutely. Uh, you have been also, are I think at this moment, a financial advisor to the government of Moldova. Exactly, I'm mean, the senior economic expert to a project mm -hmm. that the Commission is supporting in Moldova uh, uh, to implement the DCFTA, which is a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement between signed between Moldova and the European Union. Uh, last week. It was not only signed by Moldova, it was also Ukraine, I think. It was Ukraine and Georgia. And, Georgia. and uh, these are major challenges, you are absolutely right. Uh, and it's a challenge both of economic policy but also foreign policy of Europe. 
uh, the, the world is changing rapidly. We see a dismantling of states uh, throughout the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, and I would say Eastern, uh, the Eastern neighborhood countries. Uh, I'm afraid I don't see that the Europeans have a clear strategy as a long-term strategy protecting or expanding the interests of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, to me, Europe uh, there should be uh, some kind of an accord between a strategic vision as to how the European Union will collaborate both with the United States on the one hand but with Russia on the other and how it will tackle the new emerging global powers like China. Uh, there has to be a vision, there has to be leadership on the European side to be able to manage these tensions. Uh, which are, all, of course, a lot related with energy tensions as well. And uh, I hope that we will be able to manage these in a peaceful way. You hope? You don't? You don't? Are you optimist about it? Are you optimistic? Uh, I, you see, <laughs> after the, the experience I've had in politics, I think it's people who make the changes. <laughs> and you need kind of uh, leaders, leaders in Europe who would have a collective European interest in mind. And, uh, Are there such uh, <laughs> leaders in sight? I'm afraid I don't see them now. Professor Katseli, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being with us at New Europe Studios.